All right, welcome everybody to another live session of the Product-Led Expert Q&A. My name is Ramli John, uh, Managing Director of Product-Led. Today, I have Stephanie Cox. She is VP of Marketing and Sales at Lumovate. Stephanie has more than 15 years of marketing and sales experience in B2B, B2C, and B2B2C. And she also hosts the Real Marketers Show, as well as, as she just told me, she has a lot of rants and strong opinions. We'll get to that, especially when it comes to product-led. But first of all, Stephanie, how are things with you? I'm great. I'm waiting for it to get warm in Indiana. It was warm this weekend, and then it snowed on Tuesday. But it's going to be 80 next week, so Indiana needs to get her weather together. <laughs> Uh, it's the same here. It snowed yesterday in Toronto, and then it, it became sunny, which is, uh, I don't it's, get the weather. It's April. <laughs> it's supposed to be spring. <laughs> well, to everybody, welcome. Welcome to this uh, live session. Uh, we're The topic for today is we're going to be talking about what it takes to go from sales-led to product-led, mm -hmm. and particularly when it comes to Lumavate, that journey has happened. So can you share a little bit of your the story of Lumavate, of that journey from, from sales-led to product led? Yeah, so Lumivate is a company that enables marketers to build apps without code. We've been around for about five years and we've always been you know, direct sales driven, primarily in the upper mid market enterprise space. And about two years ago, I started suggesting and proposing um, as part of our leadership team planning that we think about going product led. And at first everyone was very nervous about that. <laughs> Right, because it was a big shift, and I think it was, you know, well, you know, what's the value of that? How, how do we think about that? Who else has done it this way, right? Because a lot of companies today, especially in software, start product led and then mm -hmm. maybe add a sales organization later. Um, you've, there's just not a lot of companies that have done it the other way or that talk about it honestly. And so we started having that conversation. It was called what, maybe December 2018. And then we really made the decision last year to, as part of our like planning cycle for 2020, that we were going to invest in product led, that we really saw that as, you know, a big portion of the future of our business. And, you know, the goal was that we would launch it, you know, sometime in early 2021. So we'd start working on the product changes, the organizational changes that need to happen. And then COVID hit. And I think like a lot of people, you know, we started realizing, okay, we're going to not be able to get on a plane and go fly and see people. And we're going to need to be able to do different things. People are going to get burnt out on Zoom, et cetera. And it really accelerated our, you know, journey to product led. So we really pulled that up on our timeline pretty dramatically and ended up launching in November of last year. Really fascinating. So, I mean, when it comes to that, uh, what have been some of the, the challenges with that? I mean, you, you talked about obviously COVID and what, what are some yeah. challenges? And this is something that you're right. Like there isn't a lot of, there's only, yeah, there isn't a lot of companies that's going from sales side to product side. Just it's, it's hard. It's almost like um, trying to change a cruise ship and <laughs> changing directions. Yeah. There's already a mindset shift, the culture. So, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I'm leading into that. What, what have been some of the challenges that you saw uh, transitioning from, from sales side to product led? I mean, how much time do we got? We got, cause there's <laughs> a lot. Um, well, I think the biggest one is, you know, when you're sales led, you have control over a lot of things. You have control of who you target. You have control of the messaging they get, what they see in your product when they see it, your pricing, really the entire experience. And that's not just from a marketing and sales perspective, but it's also from a customer success perspective, right? So like for us, you know, we were training all of our users of our product. And, you know, during training sessions that oftentimes were specific for their company. And then you go to product led or you talk about going to product led. And basically what you're telling your team, especially is not only do we have to make all these product changes, not only do we have to think about operationally, you know, serving people differently, but you now have no control. You know, you can't control the experience when someone comes to your website, creates a free account at 10 p.m. on a Friday, and they make a decision about your product in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Because that's what happens. And for people that are used to having a lot of control, it's really hard to start to understand what that means and how you have to think about controlling the experience differently, right? 
I like, for instance, we put help content throughout our entire platform. So we have lots of help icons that, you know, tell you what to do, how to use different stuff. But a product led growth user that comes in that way may never click on one. They may never watch the videos that we create that are embedded in the product. Um, so how do you, you know, ensure that experience is delightful when they're not going to follow the behavior path that you may want them to or that you may have created for them? Because by nature, I think a lot of times as humans, as much as we want them to read the instructions, as much as we want them to click on the help and watch the video, <laughs> we're all like, we're smart. I'm just going to click around and figure this out. And that's yeah. what people do. <laughs> so I think that was like a big one is getting people to understand like, the moment this goes on the website, and I talk to my team especially about it for like six months, you're going to lose control and you're not going to like it. And it's going to feel real uncomfortable because now sales, when you get involved, you're not, you know, introducing them to Limovate. You're probably answering very specific questions about can it do this? Mm. Can it do that? Like you can't control the demo because they don't need a demo because they've wow. already been in the product. Now, with that said, you know, the flip side is people who come into your product and start using your product and continue to use your product and mm. want to talk to sales are higher quality than anyone else you would have gotten earlier. Right. And so your ability to, you know, work them through a funnel faster is a lot more improved. I think the other thing that people, you know, don't realize is even if you've had a successful product that people loved before, mm. when you switch to product led, they will use it differently. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is like the biggest shock for people. I mean, like, I right. know it was something like I said that and we rebuilt. So for us, we actually rebuilt a lot of our product um, and spent a lot, a lot of time on redoing the UI to make it more user friendly, to think about, you know, integrate help everywhere, this type of stuff that we know we needed to do for product led. But even with that, you know, we had two factor authentication and we sell into the mid-market enterprise. Like that's kind of a requirement <laughs> to have something like that. And we've never had problems with it before we went to product led. And now in product led, you know, we were seeing people drop off when they had to do the two factor. They'd create their account password, but then they'd stop at two factor. And part of that's because they don't know what it is. It's 10 p.m. at night. I don't want to go get my phone. What is the Google Authenticator app? Right. Um, like it's just, it, it's a, it, it's another step in the process. And so it's interesting because I don't think anyone on our team would have told you, you know, back in November, that was going to be a problem for us and something that we need to think about and not yeah. just think about removing, right? Because you still want to offer it to other people, but okay, now where does it fit in free versus paid? Mm -hmm. What product changes have to happen? Um, that's the, I think the thing that as you see how people use your product differently, some of those things are easy to fix and some of them are more complicated and that take a little bit more time. And then I think the last one I would say is, and I don't know if everyone else would agree with me on this kind of statement, but I think product led is a little bit like e-commerce. Interesting. Um, and the reason why I say that, cause I have, a, I've done some time in e-commerce is, mm -hmm. you know, e-commerce companies are uber focused on behavior patterns. They're uber focused on, you know, what did you click? How did you get in your cart? How long was it in your cart? What else did you do? They're focused on daily metrics, right? How many people are coming to the site? What, are, what does revenue look like every single day? And they're never trying to make these dramatic improvements. It's a lot of like little daily improvements that they're making to the process, to the marketing, et cetera. And that's different than maybe the traditional B2B software model with the direct sales, right? Mm -hmm. Where you launch these big campaigns or, you know, you have a big event coming up. Um, I'm not saying you can't do that for PLG. It's just a different approach, right? You know, for us that we started to think about is, you know, the idea of having quarterly releases is not frequent enough for product led, mm -hmm. right? You have to be releasing weekly or bi-weekly and getting those communications out, right? right? Even if it means that you're still doing the same amount of work and you're just breaking up when people hear about it, because that's another way that you show value, right? And get someone back in your product. And it, so I think it's just, it's different. 
that's really fast. There's so much to unpack in that answer. Thank you. No, it's great. Like that's, that's some of the things that I didn't really think about. One of the things that you said that for me, just like, oh yeah, that makes sense is you lose control. <laughs> you lose control. Cause like with sales, uh, sales led, you have this demo, you're controlling the experience. You are mm -hmm. guiding them through a linear path. And once you open it up, it becomes like this open world where anything is possible. And I guess one of the challenge with that and something that I talked about yesterday with Arpit is about making sure you have the data. Like when, when mm -hmm. you lose control, <laughs> One of the control things you can get back is making sure you have the right tracking in place. So, like, did first of all, do you have the analytics in place when you are, when you open this this um uh, this free this, this free account? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or if not, like, what what have you implemented with your team to make sure that you are you know tracking what people are doing so that you can make the changes in the product? Yeah, it's a journey, right? Um, and I think the reason why I say that is. If you wait until you have everything to launch product led, you will never launch it because you'll never have everything. Um, so we launched with the ability to manually track um, every single account, their behavior, what they do, what they don't do. Some of that was through some reporting, like with Sumo Logic, that we could run, and some of that was, you know, really looking at customer accounts individually and seeing where they were at in the process. And so, you know, we started with a Google Sheet. <laughs> <laughs> that my team updated every single day. And they would, you know, customer success would go in, pull numbers, look at accounts, look at what was published, et cetera. And it gave us a ton of data. And, you know, what we've been doing since then is starting to move that one, how can we automate that data so we don't have to manually pull it? Because it's real easy to do when you get started and you're getting like, you know, I think for us, our first couple of weeks, we were without any promotion, we were looking at like 40 or 50 accounts coming in just organically. Um, it's real easy to do it then. It gets real hard when your numbers start to grow <laughs> um, and it's not scalable. But it helped us quickly see stuff. It also helped us to be able to see stuff that, you know, you reporting is never going to give you. Like for us, if we allow you to build an app, we don't not just care like what where you're at in the app building process. We also care what's the use case. Like what how are what are you trying to build an app for? And there's no reporting that would give us that, right? So there was some value to it. Um, the thing we implemented next was Pendo, um, mm. and really right around getting a, one, a different layer of data, but then also starting to think about, you know, and in, better in-app messaging in terms of guides, you know, and we've, you know, have a roadmap for that as well, right? We didn't go out and say like, okay, Pendo launches, we had this like first time user experience and it's done, right? We said, okay, Pendo's launched. We're going to let Pendo start collecting data. A week later, we have a release coming out. We're going to do a release guide right and like and then we're going to add this on and this on and this on and so we actually like have a roadmap for how deep we want pendo to get you know by the end of the year and i think sometimes people will say like oh well you should launch with everything and i'm like you shouldn't because i don't know how people are going to use pendo mm. they've never seen that in my product right right um are they going to use it in my product the same way they use it in other products i don't know and it's been interesting right like so I'll give you a, a really easy example. Mm. We just did a release comm, right? So everyone got an email about it, like they typically would, right? It was also an in-product notification. So the next time you logged in, it showed you. And it had a video. It was the exact same video that was in the email. More people watched the video in product than they did in the email. Interesting. Right? And so yeah. what was fascinating about that to us was, you know, we're seeing people spend, I think the video was uh, less than two minutes. We're seeing people spend like two minutes, 15 seconds, and two and a half minutes on this release prompt and product, right? Which is not what you would expect. So what it kind of told us was, okay, so, you know, if it's the right type of video, we can get people to watch it. Mm. So do we think then, right, as we're building the first time user experience for people that come in through PLG, is the first thing a video versus text? Is it not that slide that you see a lot of times, right? I think that's what's important. And it'll be interesting to see if that behavior continues, right? Because that might be, oh, this is interesting. I know I'm going to do this. And they may not do that moving forward. So we've been, I think, trying to use the data and to think about what we do next versus like trying to do everything at once or waiting until everything is done and then being mm -hmm. surprised that something doesn't work or people don't engage the way that we thought. And then we also, you know, I think the last step for us is how does all that data get into our CRM? 
mm. automatically, right? So like, I wanna know, I want, you know, you log into the platform, I want that logged tied to your contact record and Salesforce, right? Because then I can think about marketing differently. I can think about sales and success differently um, mm. versus, right, going mm. to, which is where it lives now, a Google sheet. <laughs> it has multiple different pieces of data points going into that. Um, I want to do reporting on it. I want to do automations on it mm. that aren't importing a Google sheet every couple of days to do stuff. That makes, that makes a ton of sense. And I mean, you're one of the questions we get a lot, uh, ask a lot is what is the right data stack for becoming product led? Cause data, mm -hmm. data is like the heart of, for me, for the heart of product led mm -hmm. is what the sales team use to qualify leads and marketing so that they can automate and really personalize and product to figure out what uh, features to build or what in app stuff that they should do. So like you talked about Pendo, the data gets sent to Salesforce. Like, can you talk a little bit about like your data stack so that you make sure yep. that you have a holistic picture of your, your users? Yeah. So currently um, we use Simo logic. That's where like all of our login data gets sent to. Um, so we can tell you how many times you've logged in. Um, that's where we know if you, you know, we use auth zero for authentication, but that goes into Simo. It tells us, you know, did you log in? Did you create a password, but not two factor, right? In our previous process. It also tells us, you know, did you, we have starter kits, which are like at templates. Did you use one of those? Which ones did you use? Um, and then we have Pendo data. And so, you know, right now, all of that goes into a Google sheet <laughs> and some other stuff that's manually pulled. And then we just upload that. Um, we use Salesforce and we use Pardot for all of our automation. And then, you know, we also use Google Analytics. So I think Pendo is great. Um, I think Google Analytics was a way that you know, before we implemented Pendo for us to get additional data as well around just our platform usage, how people are using it, how, you know, what pages they're spending time on, how long, what different things within those pages they're clicking on. It's given us another layer of data as well. It's not, you know, obviously it's not individual driven, it's more aggregate, but it's helpful to kind of see that across our entire customer base. Now we also have plans, right? Like that's not what my tech stack's gonna look like in a year. But I think we've been, you know, really tried to be smart about not buying a bunch of tech and implementing it and having to spend so much time worried about, you know, getting development to implement new tech into the product versus on focusing on that user experience. And, you know, we're only, you know, less than six months under this journey with product led. And for us, we still are figuring out what our magic numbers are. Yeah. Like, that's the thing I think people don't realize is you know, our magic numbers of what gets someone to get further in the process or to convert are going to be very different early on than they are six months later or a year later when the product's different. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is, you know, we look at a lot of data right now. And if I'm being honest, probably too much data <laughs> because we're trying to figure out, right. you know, what are like the four or five data points that really matter? Mm. And, um, you know, even in this six month journey so far, we've seen those data points change as we fixed or changed the process, right? What used to be, you know, a blocker or, you know, was something that drove a certain behavior. We've now seen based on changes to product or changes even just to messaging, like that's no longer an issue. Like that's no longer a, deter a factor of success because it's easy for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that, you know, why I say it's a little bit like e-commerce is consumer behavior is constantly changing. Mm. So you can't just assume that what worked and what was driving conversions and like these three data points that, you know, helped you qualify someone in March are the same that are gonna be in October wow. or November. Especially if you're evolving your product at the rate that you have to in order to truly engage your base. Mm. Now, if you're doing nothing, I'm sure it's probably the same, but I think you have <laughs> other problems. <laughs> so that is so good. Like you, that's just like, a like I had just, I just had shivers when you said you, what the, your users are doing in March can be different completely. And one thing I'm hearing and just reiterating is a few people kind of hear this for themselves is if you're going to go product led, you have to deliver or implement a lot quicker than before yes. like it can't be the same waterfall uh six months <laughs> deliver to deliver something so that's really interesting 
I, I want to take a step back and go back to the beginning, the discussions around product led. And we were yeah. chatting before this around rents that you have, and particularly around product led growth. When when people think about product led growth, one of the things they look at it is it's a way for them to get more leads and more signups. It's it's to them it's a marketing slash way to scale their their yeah their leads essentially. Was that a discussion early on? And if that is wrong, like what was that discussion that you had with your team to really move to product led? Yeah, so I think um, people will tell you, you know, especially as you think about like an inbound engine, right? So in a direct sales model, that's I schedule a demo. And if you've ever looked at intent data, or if you've ever looked at IP driven data for your website, there will be a lot more people in your ICP, especially if you're doing marketing right, that come to your website and never request a demo or don't request it when they come there. Why? Because they know they will get called by sales. <laughs> um, and depending on your model, they might get called within like five minutes of them requesting a demo or then you know, downloading white paper. When you think about product led, I think people sometimes say, oh, well, we'll get more people then to be able to get more leads that our sales team can chase. It's different. So, and the reason why I say that is if you were selling, especially in the upper mid market enterprise space, you know, we sell to marketers, the VP of marketing doesn't come in at an enterprise company and create a free account. Why? That's not something they will do. They might schedule a demo, but they don't come in and create a free account. You know who does it? The marketing specialist, the marketing manager, the person probably really running the project. They create the account. And they are the ones that will convert. Now, it doesn't mean you don't get to that VP or that CMO. It's just different. And I think sometimes people you know, assume, oh, we'll get more leads because we'll get more signups for our sales team to chase. Mm. I mean, if you call a lead an email address, then OK. <laughs> I mean, right? But if you want like a bunch of email addresses, you know, you need to buy Zoom info and go through that, right? Like, and then we can call all of them leads, um, which is another rant we could go on. But product led growth isn't like this go to market strategy. It's not this like new channel for you to get more mm. leads. It's not like, oh, LinkedIn ads or, you know, paid search or events. Mm. It is a business strategy. Mm. And I think that is a fundamental challenge for a lot of people, especially if they're going from sales led to product led, um, or even if they're product led and they're adding a sales team. You know, product led is different. Everything about your business is different. We've already talked about being able to move faster, looking at data differently. Mm. I mean, you know, people who and product led, like they create I, and marketers are notorious for this. I do this myself, right? When I want to look at a new top, like software stack, it for some reason it's always at like 10 p.m. at night. It's not like during the work day. It's when I'm on my couch with my laptop watching mm. TV. And you know that behavior is very different. I don't want someone to call me. I want to figure out if this is if this is worthwhile. I want to be successful and I'm probably going to make a blanket decision about your product and your brand in 10 to 15 minutes if you're lucky you get that much. Mm. And so are those leads? I mean their email addresses and you may have their phone number if you required them, but they're different. And so those people don't want to talk to sales all, all the time. They don't necessarily want to go like do a DocuSign. They want to mm. upgrade via credit card. Like they may never talk to you and use your product and log in every day. And that's hard, especially when you're going from direct sales to product led. And I talked to my student about this earlier this week. You know, our director of customer success was like, I mean, we reached out to all these people that are using the product like a lot and they don't re like they don't respond to us. And I'm like, because they don't want to. It's not because they're not happy because they're mm. logging in every day doing different stuff. Right. Right. Um, whereas a lot of times, right, if you had someone that came in like through more of a direct sales model and you reached out to them and asked for their feedback, they're probably going to give it to you. Mm. It's, it's just a different environment. So you have to think operationally different about your business, right? Like, no, we're not going to invoice people, you know, we're going, they're going to have credit cards set up and they're going to bill automatically. And how do we think about, you know, 
let's stop talking about ARR and start talking about MRR. Mm -hmm. Even though they might be annual contracts, you know, it, you will see the MRR change faster. Right. Um, so it's just, it's a different, it's a different mindset. And that's why it's not just a channel that you can just add on and expect it to work. And what you need to be successful, I think you guys talk a lot about like their eureka moment, right? Like that moment of like, yes, I get what you're trying to do. And yes, this can help me. That is different for someone at 10 p.m. at night than it is for someone that comes in who has told your value proposition, who was shown like the specific parts of the platform that, you know, articulate their need, right? Because that's what a lot of times you do in sales. Uh, I've done that myself is we hear your problem and then we show you the three or four ways that our product solves your problem. We don't show you the whole thing if you're mm -hmm. a good like enterprise sales rep. When you come into the product now, you see the whole thing, right? Um, you're not just pointed to the areas that will solve your problem. Um, so it's just, it's different. It's a fundamental business change. So. I, I love that. It's totally true. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a big misconception. You're right. It's just a, a marketing strategy to get more users. You're right. I love how you put it as a business strategy because like how your each of the, uh, each of the, uh, each of the function forms differently from product sales, customer success, uh, yeah. and, and marketing. And I guess just to, as a follow-up question to you, what you were just talking about, you're right. Like a lot of people don't want to talk to sales. But some some of them do for and yes. I'm curious for you like do you wait do you wait for people to raise their hands or do is there uh, a more there's a certain limit that users hit and you know that it's the time for for sales to reach out to quote unquote product qualified leads but like whatever yeah. you, uh, people call it like hot leads do you, so what is the process right now do you do you uh, is there a proactive approach versus are you more waiting for people to raise their hands up. Um, it's a little bit of both. Um, so I think, you know, as you mature in this journey, you start to figure out those magic numbers and you can start putting in with really great accuracy, you know, who has a higher propensity to buy. Um, and we have some of that right now. And I think we will continue to get better at it. But we have chosen for the most part to not have sales be the first one to reach out. Um, mainly because we know marketers don't necessarily always love talking to sales. and you know, no matter how wonderful your sales team is, you know, just their title alone feels like they're selling something to you. And so what we've done instead is really focus on our customer success team reaching out first and really focusing on how we can make sure you're super successful with the product. And then what we've noticed from that is the people who engage with our customer success team, it's almost like another gate in a lot of ways because then they'll pass them over to sales once it's like that person starts talking about additional functionality that's only on a paid plan um, or talking about like scaling up and not just doing one app but doing 10 and what that looks like and you know really starting to develop not just the product qualified lead but really the account qualification right and so to us you know i think now is that how we're gonna do it forever probably not um you know, because I think just things change, but it's been a lot more successful than having, you know, like a salesperson go direct because when, you know, customer success manager reaches out, just the title alone that you see in the email, your, re your initial reaction is different. And it's not like, I want to talk to you about upgrading. It's like, Hey, I noticed you're trying to do this. You know, we've been testing out like personalized video with that. We've been testing out like sending, you know, quick little, like, Hey, I noticed you're doing this. Here's how you would do that in the product. Or this is a really cool, additional way like component you might want to use in your app i want to make sure you are aware of it like happy to hop on a 15 minute call and walk you through this and that seems helpful and what it's doing is getting people deeper in our product and it's getting them to figure out for us to figure out like are you going to convert or not and do you need to do that need help to do that or are you going to do it yourself right mm -hmm. um it's just it's a different approach but we found people to be more receptive and it totally makes sense. Like if somebody comes out to you, can I sell you something versus can I help you? It's, <laughs> yeah, you're going to say yes it's to that. It's simple, right? But like, it's, yeah. it's, a, I'm surprised at how many mm -hmm. times, even myself, when, you know, I create a free account, like, you know, within two or three days, like a sales rep's trying to get me to upgrade. Right. And I, I get why they're doing that. Right. Like mm. I own the number for Limovate. So I get that more than a lot of other people might. 
But the same token, I also understand human behavior. Mm. No one wants to be sold to. Right. That totally, that totally makes sense. You're right. Nobody wants to be sold to. They, they want to be taught or entertained or uh, yeah, anything else but being sold to is exactly right. right. Exactly. I, I want to, uh, I guess in that vein, or we're talking about sales. Uh, I want to talk about marketing side. And I believe you have another rant around why marketing qualified lead is uh, is no longer relevant. Can so you talk a little rats. bit about? Uh, can you talk a little bit about what how you see MQL in the whole uh, product led motion? Yeah, so it it's funny, and I we talked a little bit about this already, and kind of my thought on it. But you know, when people say they want leads, we need more leads. Marketing needs to deliver these qualified leads, and you know, great. So what does that mean? And I think every marketing senior leader could tell you, oh, well, that means the following for my organization. They reached this number of points. They showed this type of behavior. Um, but here's the thing. In reality, when you say you want to lead, you want an email address and a phone number of someone to contact, someone your sales team can contact, someone that has shown some sort of interest in your product. And I use the word interest vaguely because that could be anything from intent data that could be anything from, they've downloaded a couple of white papers. I mean, let's be honest, who has ever bought something because they downloaded white papers or eBooks? It's just not like, that's not a good indication of my willingness or interest in purchasing. It's usually because I thought the content was helpful. Now I'm not saying that marketing shouldn't do all those things because <laughs> you should, <laughs> but I think this idea of, you know, marketing qualifying leads, to pass over the sales for sales to go chase mm. isn't necessarily the way the world works anymore and how we mm. should think about it. So you're qualified because you came to my website, you cr maybe created an account or you download, let's say you didn't, let's say you just downloaded some content and now I know and you've reached, you know, whatever my scoring metric is and I pass you over to sales. That is really showing no interest in purchasing. Mm. Like, right? Or just because you talk to someone, you know, at an event or a booth, unless you said you had an opportunity and you are looking for that solution, in my opinion, you're not qualified for anything. <laughs> and so I think it's different, right? So like, you know, when we were more direct sales focused and that was, you know, really our only our primary business strategy, we talked a lot about qualified opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to get marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads. I don't want to talk about the number of meetings scheduled. I want to talk about qualified opportunities because qualified opportunities mean that it's an account that is in our ICP with the right person who has budget and wants to buy a solution like ours. Mm -hmm. That is what a lead is. Mm -hmm. A lead is not someone that has given you their contact information. Because if you want more leads, like go look in the yellow pages. Like it's just, it's this old school mentality of like, the only way to buy was to talk to, you know, was to go through this process. And that worked five to 10 years ago. It doesn't work today. You know, people, people purchase differently. Their expectations, even especially in B2B, were like, oh, well, they're a B2B buyer. No, they were a consumer who expects yeah. to be sold to like a consumer who just happens to be buying for their business. My experience today and how I want to deal with software providers is no different than how I want to deal with Netflix. I don't want to call Netflix to create an account. I don't want to call them when I have a problem. I want to do it whenever I want to do it <laughs> myself. Now, does my mom call Netflix? A thousand percent yes, right? And there are people who will want, to, just like with any, right? There are people who will want to. Um, but... I also think there's this whole self-service mentality that we have because B2C companies have made it so, look so easy that we have to start dealing with. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we don't gate any of our content and we haven't for a while um, yeah. because you know what? You downloading my ebook and reading my ebook is no indication that you want to purchase from me. It's an indication that you're interested in that topic. Right. Now, you watch a demo video of our product, higher indication. Mm. But you also could be like a college student who's just interested or someone who is just curious, right? Like, and I think we even see that with product-led growth. 
that's what people don't realize. You know, I think, you know, kind of like industry average numbers are, you know, 10% of product product um, accounts that come in through like a freemium or a free trial will typically convert, mm. which means you get 90% that don't. And I don't think some people think about like, that's a lot. Yeah. And part of that's because people come in because they're just curious. They're like, oh, what is this? I've heard about this. They have no intention of buying your product. Like someone mentioned it to them or they saw an ad for it and they're like, oh, it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm interested. Let's see what this is. And they log in once and they never come back. <laughs> right. Um, you know, you also have people who come in with a very specific, they know exactly what they're going to use your product for. They have a use case. They are looking for that type of solution and they are truly evaluating you. And then you have people that I call in the middle, which are, and this is, I think, tends to be the larger enterprises. I am knowing I need to, like in our case, build an app. It's on my roadmap for Q2. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do that. Mm. Is it with a platform? Is it with an agency? Is it with, you know, internal resources? And they're, yes, they have a project per se or a use case, but they're really trying to figure out the mechanism for getting it done. So their behavior is also very different than, you know, this bucket I talked about previously, because they're going to come in and they're going to do weird things with your product that aren't going to make a lot of sense because they're trying to evaluate the functionality, not trying to do the one thing, right? Especially marketers. Um, and so like for us, we've really started to bucket everyone that comes in into one of those three buckets um, because it's behavior that we've seen. Like, like I, I use Calendly as an example because Calendly is, I think, a, another great example um, of product led. When I first tested out Calendly, I didn't invite my whole team to it. Mm. I looked at it. I set up my account. I didn't even schedule a meeting. I was like, oh, this is easy. I see how the preview works. And then I upgraded. And I think I did all of that in like a 10 minute period. <laughs> right. Um, which it's great for Calendly. <laughs> but like, other people are gonna behave differently, right? Other right. people might come in and say, might not connect any calendars. I wanna look at what functionality Calendly has or how do they handle user permissions? Or you know, what is the setup like? And they might be evaluating 10 other providers and never connect a single calendar to any of them until they narrow down the ones they wanna do it. And that might be three months later. And that's the thing I think when I talk about constant iteration and why it's so important to have like weekly or biweekly releases is you can't assume someone who you know, engaged and created a free account and did some behavior at the beginning of March isn't going to come back. Now, some of them aren't, but right. some of them were like <clears throat> making a short list, especially in the enterprise space of providers, and they're going to come back 30, 60 days later. And they're going to come back sooner if you constantly are messaging to them not to upgrade, but about your value prop and what you can provide to someone. Right. Um, I think that's the misconception, right? Like a lot of product led growth companies want to get you to upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Oh, you didn't upgrade within like the 14 day or whatever the period is for them. Discount, discount, discount. Right. <laughs> right? Instead yeah. of like saying, why didn't you upgrade? Mm. Do you yeah. not see the value? Because chances are, and this is, I think, a misconception a lot of people have. One of the first things that people do when they see that something is free is they go check out your pricing page. It's mm. one of the reasons we moved pricing into our top nav. It was right. on our platform before because we saw what behavior. They went to our free account page to create an account. And before they create an account, they jump back to pricing. They have to go find pricing, look at, because they want to know if I like this, how much does it cost? Mm, that's good. Right? And so now our behavior we see is different is we see people on the pricing page, then create an account, which then caused us to go, we need to add more like CTAs on the pricing page where you can create the account from that page. Um, but it's true, right? Like you don't want to start using something for free like it. <laughs> Knowing it has, you know, limited functionality, however you structure that, or if it's a trial, you know, limited days, and then realize the paid option is way outside your budget. Interesting. Yeah, that's true. But people don't think about that. Yeah. Okay. And rant. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. It's good rants. I mean, that's something that uh, copywriters are seeing. Like, uh, I know Josh Garfalo from Squay Copy is like, they, that's exactly the behavior people see. They jump from the homepage to the pricing page. That's a really interesting uh, behavior that now has changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, just staying in the, in the realm of marketing, 
Uh, you talked about how you've now ungated all your content. Are, is there yeah. is there anything else that's changed from a marketing point of view for product for a product led company as well as what's working now uh, that wouldn't work in obviously a sales yeah. led uh, motion? So what's interesting about it is you know when you looked at us and we were direct sales, we were very ABM focused, right? We ran detailed ABM campaigns with paid with you know, paid media strategies, direct mail strategies, SDRs, et cetera. And we were very successful at doing that. Um, you know, Some of the campaigns that we would run would get like 70% of the people we targeted, we get meetings with. So that worked. None of that works in product-led. <laughs> um, because the people that you try and reach out to, to get a meeting with that are senior decision makers, don't create free accounts. Right, so you can't do your same tactics, and the difference too is people who create free accounts do it differently, right? Like they don't want to book a meeting; they want to go whenever they want to go and do that. So we've looked at a lot of different strategies. So like SEO is a big strategy for us. It was a strategy for us before with direct. It's even a bigger, a bigger one today, and you know, paid has changed. So if you're targeting you know, companies, I think a lot of B2B marketers that are primarily direct sales driven are gonna say LinkedIn ads is my best friend. I love them and I hate them, right? Um, LinkedIn ads doesn't work well for us for product led. But you know what does? Facebook? Just <laughs> in display. Display, interesting, yeah. Right? Um, and Spotify? which I Spotify. never would have told. I See, you just had the what? same facial reaction I did when someone told me, I've got to try Spotify. I was like, that's hilarious. Like audio there, Spotify ads? Yes, audio Spotify ads. And it, if you want to know, like my number one hack right now, if you're a product-led growth company, is you can get started <laughs> on Spotify for $250. They create the ad for you. Now, your targeting is a little all over the place, right? Because you can't right. target specific shows or, you know, you right. target like interest areas. Um and they create an ad for you for $250 and that is impressions and they do all of your ads and you get to listen to it and you write the copy, they hire the voiceover, et cetera. They do it really fast, usually same day. And we were seeing a lower <laughs> CPA on Spotify than LinkedIn. What like Spotify was way cheaper for us than LinkedIn and way more effective. Um, and it's so it's worth a try because think about it, right? Like you could just do like and what we did, right? Just go to Lumave and your ad, Lumave.com slash Spotify to create a free account. And they also, you know, have the little like graphic too that pops up when you're on the ad version. And we saw people doing it, which I never would have thought yeah. was like make Crazy. any sense for us. But it's a really cost effective channel. Um, but display is another good one. Like we don't we do a little bit of the retargeting stuff that everyone does, but really how we use display is we target, you know, for us, not a little bit of our competitors, but also we know that marketers use us. So we target people who also visited HubSpot, mm. Salesforce Marketing Cloud in our display ads. And that's been a really effective channel for us as well. And as you guys know, display is super cost effective. And then right. paid search. Um, we've always done paid search. I will tell you that you know, since launching product led, we've invested and will continue to invest more in paid search, at least initially. Um, it's not a long term model, right? <laughs> SEO is more of your long term cost effective model. But it is really helpful for us because, you know, we are spending, you know, the same we were with direct on paid search, but our conversion rate is so much higher. Because when someone look comes to our page now, you know, they didn't want to talk, weren't ready to talk to someone in sales yet. Now they can just create an account and see what it is and see if it meets their need. And so you're getting more of the people who are in the funnel and who are further down the funnel, but didn't want to talk to someone because they didn't want to be sold to yet to see where, you know, to see what that funnel looks like across the entire market. So those are some of, some of the strategies that we're doing, but SEO, I think, mm -hmm. and it's not the thing I tell everyone is it's the hardest one to explain to your board and your leaders, like senior leaders. Right. Because everyone expects, especially with digital, like marketing to have these instantaneous results. Like you launched, a, you know, we launched new campaigns on paid search or upped our budget to X. We should see an immediate result. And you will. 
on SEO, you will see that result in six to nine months. <laughs> like <laughs> it's just, it, there's nothing you can do, <laughs> right. you know? So I, I try and tell people like you have to, it can't be these like pockets, like where we invest in SEO, we make a big SEO push like one quarter. You have to do it every single week. You have to be making investments on it every single week. Um, to see that ongoing run rate and to keep improving and just to make the Google algorithms work for you. Hmm. That's such a good way. Spotify. Spotify. I know ads. it's weird. <laughs> I know. I'm going to try it now. That's super, try it. super interesting. And it's just, it, do you sell, do you give it, what's the offer? Like go to lumavate.com for Spotify, Spotify and then what get a discount? Like what is free. it? No, just oh, build try it for free. Yeah, build your app, for, build your first app for free. It's like a thirty second. Ad. I mean, it's super simple, thirty second ad. And I, one of my um, really good friends who's worked for me before, that is an expert and paid. He was like, "You've got to try this." I've been doing this for other companies. It works so well. And I was like, "We're not doing this." And then I finally was like, "It's two hundred fifty dollars." Like, like it seems ridiculous not to try it. And then we did, and I was like, "Crap, this works." So, and it works, so but I mean, it was, I never would have thought so. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, you know, we're about to, uh, hit our time just to wrap up it, the final one, just a final question that I'd like to ask you, if you can give like an advice, what, what advice would you give to companies right now who are trying to make their transition from sales to product line? And it could be that advice could be something that we talked about right now, or mm -hmm. it could be something that we, that another rent that you have for them. That's not something that we have talked about yet. So what's your advice for companies who are going sales led to product line? You will be most successful if you get everyone on board and everyone agrees that this is not a new channel, that this is a new business strategy. And we are, and product led is the way we sell it. The misconception people have sometimes is when you say that they think it means you don't need sales. You still need sales. Sales just is different and how sales interacts with people is different, but you still need a sales team, um, throughout the process. I think the other thing I would say is reach out to someone who's done it. Um, because they will help you and I'm happy to talk to people about it in our experience, but they will help you understand the things, and we don't have time for it today, right? All the things that we learned that I wish someone would have told me, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I found a couple of people that had done this, that I got some knowledge from them and we didn't have some of the, you know, mistakes that they made, I didn't make. Because it's hard. You don't think about how much of your business has to change. Like from as simple as like, did you take credit card before? Right. To, your entire Salesforce instance, org structure, the fields you collect, the process flows, all probably need to be blown up. Every part of your business changes. And a lot of times you don't, if you don't have a bigger picture of that and you don't talk to someone who's been like, oh, we were two months in and realized we weren't doing this or like mm -hmm. we needed to do this and it really helps. So that would be my number one advice is like talk to someone who's been there and then you know, if you're leading the sales team or the marketing team or even the product team, like you've got to start telling them as you prepare on this journey, you will lose control. We <laughs> will have to go faster because that's the thing that I think is the biggest culture change. And some people love that and they get real excited. And some people it doesn't work for because they don't, that's not their personality. Um, and that's okay, but I like to give people lots of notice and I like to repeat myself on those types of topics a lot. So they're not surprised when it's a Tuesday and I'm like, okay, this isn't like, clearly this is a new place where people are getting stuck. How do we get that fixed by Friday? Interesting. Like in production and done. So. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time, Stephanie. I really do appreciate it. Sounds, it was great. My pleasure. Awesome. Thank you.